Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're looking at a second submission by Chrissy of her horse Sloan. In the first video that we saw of this horse, it wasn't ever really stretching all the way down and getting as completely over its back as we would like. But their question was, is the horse improved in this one? Yes, immensely. So much improvement here. Um, the horse is stretching much better in the gates, moving much better, more actively behind, swinging through better. The stretch is much, much deeper. Now you see here they're lunging in a round pin without a line, and that's perfectly fine as long as you have a nice round pin to do it in. It's perfectly fine to lunge like this without a line on the horse. If you have a place to do it, as long as you can get the job done. But much improved, the stretch here is much, much better. The horse is swinging much better over its back. Now you've gotten the full length of the neck out. In fact, this horse looks like its neck is about a foot longer than it did in the previous video. I suggest that you guys yourself go back and look at your previous video of this horse and <clears throat> and just see how much better that is. Now, one of your question was, well, is the hunter bump improving? And I certainly think it is improving, but just know that it's going to take a, you know, a full year at least before you really see that completely disappear, um, <clears throat> maybe even working into two years. So remember, it takes two years to put a foundation on a horse, whether you're starting with one that's 10 years old, 18 year old, or, or a three year old, it's the same amount of time. Um, and depending on you know, how bad the back was when you started. But from this point forward, now you have the horse swinging over its back really nicely and stretching really deeply and stretching the whole length of the neck and stretching out from the shoulders. You're going to see this improving a lot more here in, uh, in the near future. So now that you've got everything working correctly. So this is really good, really good active trot for this horse, really stretching into the contact. It has developed a much nicer rhythm. Now you said that sometimes the horse checks out a little bit with you. Um, and then kind of wakes up and spooks at things which you're not experienced which you hadn't experienced before now i'm not sure about that um so we want the horse to get in the zone we want the horse to seem very relaxed that's exactly what we want you know so um i think you'll see that all the disappear all the uh, spooking and that sort of thing will disappear in, in a very short time because what we really want to get the horse is in that zone where it just relaxes into the contact with the reins and nothing seems to bother it and once again you're on the right track for that to happen this is so much better so much better trot work um, and just know that it, sometimes in the very beginning, you know, when horses have never been stretched over their back, it's certainly going to change their frame for a moment. That is, if they've been kind of pulled back all the time and they get in this kind of shortened frame and, you know, that people think is balanced. But of course, once again, if the horse starts moving in a bigger frame, we find the horse isn't balanced at all. So, and it has to go through that period. So that's a little bit of what I think you're experiencing here is that, you know, this horse is now developing balance on its own. Um, but it's going to have to redevelop all those muscles and start to lift itself up in front. But even the canner here, this is a much better canner than I saw in the last video. So that's coming along beautifully. I mean, everything here is just much better than it was before. So once again, go back and compare for yourselves as, as I have done. I always do that when, I, of course, I go back and look at the previous lesson to remind myself of what I saw. And I certainly uh, think this one is going much, much better. So great job. You've slowed everything down. You know, in the first video I saw of you guys, you were doing a lot of canter. And it was all very hollow and wasn't really doing the horse any good. And, and uh, But this is just, you've really gotten it under control now. So great job. All you have to do now is just keep it up and just know that the horse will develop. That's the hardest thing for people. And once again, why I said about doing all these videos that I did you know, because most people don't get a chance to be around horses developing over a long period of time. They've just simply never seen it done. So, you know, they do what they know and what they've seen. So if you've never done it, you're going around here, you know, months go by and you go, is this, this working, <laughs> you know, but it definitely is working. And I think it's really great for you guys to educate your eyes um, to go back and look at your previous video and just look at how much better the horse is stretching, how much longer its neck is how much better it's swinging through. Be fine. See, when it gets right there and it starts to have really good hawk action, that's exactly what we're looking for. But as I was saying before, you know, in the beginning, when they first start to stretch, of course they are on the forehand. You know, every horse is on the forehand until it develops enough strength to lift itself off the forehand. And that's the big thing to take home is to realize that you can never do that artificially by pulling a horse's head up or pulling the neck back into the shoulders and this kind of things that we see people doing, attempting to get the horse off the forehand. But once again, what you would find is that horses that are trained like that, um, they're really just, as soon as you go and start to get them moving out a little bit or you try to do extensions and these kinds of things, you find that everything fall apart, everything falls apart, or even just to canter the horse or to gallop. 
But once again, this is so much better now. This canner is so much better, so much longer and slower. When I saw the horse before, it was just kind of running around in the canner. Whereas this is really good. It's slowed down. It's really gotten over the back. And you're going to see this horse really, really improving. Really good swing there. And I like how you're keeping that uh, canner work to just a few moments. And that's exactly what you want to do. A couple of circles around at this level and then back to the trot. Remember, it, at any level, it doesn't do a great deal of, of uh, good to just canter for long, long periods of time. As the, you know, the canter is very hard on the horse's legs. And once again, as we go up through the gears, as the horse goes faster, there's simply more pressure on the horse's feet. Um, so we have to be very careful about that. But coming back to the walk here in the mounted work, this already looks much better. The horse is more active and swinging over its back much better than when I saw it. And just look how much longer the horse's neck is. Now, when you see the horse there in silhouette, you can still see the horse has that big dip there and has the, the hunter's bump, as people used to like to call it, uh, as if that was something good. Well, that's not something good. That's basically where the spine is beginning to fall away from the hip bones there. And if, if it proceeds to do that over a long period of time, that's how we end up with kissing spine. That is the top ridges of the horse's vertebrae start rubbing together at the top, which can basically lame a horse for life. I was just talking to someone the other day that was telling me about a six-year-old having to have an operation. I mean, imagine a six-year-old already having kissing spine, how sad that is. But once again, part of that is, is caused by, you know, people raising horses in too small an areas. Um, out here in the West, we see that a lot and also why we don't see much breeding anymore. We saw a lot of it back in the 80s, everyone trying to breed their own warm bloods. And you know, if you don't have 100 acres for them to move around on and you stand them in a 24 by 24 pen when they're babies, this is what often happens is just standing around, their spines drop because the weight of their bellies just pull the back down. So once again, that's why we have to be so careful of that. But this is much improved. And I'm sure that in the, over the next months, you're going to start seeing a big improvement in that back and that hole behind the saddle there that will fill up and the back will come back up into into the right position. That's the beauty of the classical system is once you start doing it correctly, you know, the horse kind of self heals itself, so to speak. You know, just like an older person, for instance, who's never done any kind of stretching, you know, you can do amazing things if you just start doing it and doing it regularly. So really good stretch here in the trot. Once again, that's way improved over what I saw in the last video much more completely through and over the back like there is beautiful look how nice the hawks start to move there you can see the ball rolling over the ground as i like to say the entire length of the horse's top line and that's the biggest thing to take home is you know think the top line think of the top line as one long muscle like a bicep that you're trying to engage like flex over the whole length now the, they are different muscles but they're muscles that can join uh, with each other to form the top line so, but you don't need to know all the names of those muscles. If you want to learn them all, it's a good thing to do. But the reality is that you need to think of it. It's how you think of them uh, that's important. And just thinking of the top line as one long thing and not just, you know, you'll hear people talking about, oh, I'm building up his hindquarters. Well, you don't want to build up the hindquarters. You want to build up the entire length of the horse's top line. And in your question, you also asked me, well, is it good to do trotting poles and all these kinds of things? And the answer is absolutely yes. It's good to do all those things as long as the horse is working over its back when you're doing it. It's like going up and down a hill. You'll hear people talk about, oh, I'm going to take him out and go up and down hills to build up his hindquarters. Well, that's great, <laughs> but it only works good for the horse if the horse is work over, working over its back up and down hills. It's like the cavaletti or jumping. Same thing. Jumping is great for horses, you know, to a certain extent. If... Uh, you don't overdo it and the horse is jumping over its back. Once again, that's why we want horses to jump over their back so they land and get their back feet on the ground quicker, taking the pressure off the front legs. So once again, this is just a really good trot. This is hugely improved over what I saw before. You can see where this horse wings a little bit on that left leg, but you'll find that as the horse gets uh, uh, straighter and stronger over its back, uh, it will help that as well. The horse will start to swing a little straighter even if it's not um, perfectly straight by nature. It will improve it. So once again, this has all been really, really good. This is an excellent working trot into the stretch there. Right there. That's absolutely beautiful. So once again, letting the back and the rhythm guide you. When you find that place and you learn to feel when the horse is more active and you're getting a more supple, like right there. See how deep the horse gets underneath itself with its hind legs and how much more flexion there is in the hocks? That's what we're looking for. You get that kind of bounce off the ground. 
Whereas when I first saw you, the source was kind of running. Everything was running and everything was too fast. But you've really slowed it down. You're doing a wonderful job here. That's great contact you have stretching into that. Exactly what we want to see, just like that. And just remember as the horse goes down and stretches down, you stay in the same position. If you have a shorter stirrup, you can have a little forward position. But if you are riding in a longer dressage length stirrup, you have to keep your body, upper body uh, straight above the horse because if you lean forward, you will be out of balance. Once again, this is all really good. He comes up a little bit, but you get him right back in the stretch. And once again, study these pictures and watch how the horse goes down, like right there, how much more flexion you get in the hock. And you can see the back almost lifting on by itself. So if you continue this work, um, this horse is going to develop absolutely beautiful. You have it working over its top line now. Everything's working great. All you have to do now is just keep doing it. And the horse will develop all by itself or with your help, so to speak, as long as we keep doing this and, and just testing as it comes up. You wouldn't want the pole to come much higher than that. That's getting a little, little too high. You can see how things are starting to slow down. It's looking like it's struggling a little bit in front. And then we want to let her back down again. So that's exactly what we want to do. Test the water, you know. We don't just stretch them there and just keep them in a stretch for the rest of their life. We keep testing it. So we get them all the way down there, find that optimal space, optimal movement, so to speak. And then we simply just bring the pole up. And well, as I say, with this horse, you don't need a whole lot of uh, backwards tension or any in that it, it's flexing at the jaw and pole perfectly nicely when you get it all the way out there in the neck. So that's exactly what you're looking for right there. And that's wonderful. Okay, the horse pops up a little bit and you just go on and correct it. But once again, the horse looks very comfortable and actually looks to me like it's getting in the zone. So, you know, it may be that the horse was used to kind of, you know, being like your last ride looked a little agitated to me. Everything this looks a little looked a little agitated. So that's kind of a false sense of getting the horse on the bit, you know, and um, and stabilized. But what you're going to find going like this, I think all your little spooking problems and that sort of thing are going to disappear quite rapidly. Because that's the whole point of doing this work is, you know, the horse learns that it can move in a way that it's comfortable with and actually can enjoy its work. I mean, no, our horses just look forward to coming out. They can't wait to get out in, in the ring every day. They're very happy horses. So, and they finish relaxed every day. So that was really a nice downwards transition. You didn't overpressurize the back. Now, this is exactly how you need to ride this horse. Now, you were saying something about wanting to go to a horse show in the not too distant future. And I don't think you're far away from being able to do a pretty good training level test. I mean, that would certainly be where I would put the horse. Um, your canter had improved a lot, so I think you're on the way there. And once again, just know that you don't need to do a lot of canter in order to help the horse. You need to do the trot work. And then you come and you test the canter to see how much back strength you have developed. Once again, coming back to a nice swinging walk. She comes up a little bit there, but you do a great job right there, just stretching her right back into the contact. And that's what you want to do. That's really great. And of course, when the horse is correct, it's just the weight of the rein between you and the horse. That's the only way the horse is ever going to know it's doing the right thing. And the reason that you see horses trained in this method, you know, lose that irritated look and the swishing tails and grinding teeth and all that kind of thing. Because if you are pulling against the horse's mouth, you are punishing the horse. I don't know why that is so hard for people to realize. This idea that, you know, you're holding five or ten pounds of pressure in your hands is an absurd one because... You know, go go to a gym and take one of those pulley things where you can adjust the weight and put on five pounds and see how much five pounds actually is holding against your hand. It's a lot. It would be enough to be, as I said, basically punishing the horse all the time. So the only way the horse knows whether it's doing the right thing is when you stop giving it aid. In other words, you stop bothering it with your hands and you stop bothering it with your legs. And you let the horse just cruise along. And that's what we want to do. We want to get the horse to the point where, you know, we set it and it goes at whatever pace it is, you know, until we ask it to do something different. And that's exactly what we want. But the only way to get there is like this. And coming to the canner here. Now, that's really a pretty good canner right there. And I like how the neck is getting so much longer and slower in the canner and the horse is actually starting to reach down. So really, you guys have done an amazing job with this horse since I saw the last one. You, you've taught yourselves and this is hugely improved over what I saw. Look what a nice bigger swinging stride this horse has in the canner than what I saw before. Last time I saw the canner, the horse was just running hollow. So this is immensely improved over the last time I saw it. Nice swinging canner right there. The whole length of the neck, that's absolutely beautiful. And just exactly what we want to be able to do, stretch the horse in all three gates. You know, if you watch some of our videos um, with Amber and Legolas, and you'll see how once you get this top line 
really established, everything else starts coming really quick and you get the strength and the, once the horse starts to come up on its own and we see the beginning to develop collection, you know, how easy it then is to go and start doing these uh, more difficult movements. It does not take, uh, you know, some, as I said, Herculean feet of strength to be able to ride a horse that's going correctly. It doesn't at all. You know, and once again, correct training will make your horse easier to ride, not harder to ride. So, you know, if you see, you know, someone tells you they have a schoolmaster, yet you get on and it goes completely insane, you know, that tells you how the horse has been trained. Horses that are correctly trained, you know, will will don't get angry at somebody who's just a little inaccurate with their leg or go crazy from it because they're not scared of it. The point of the classical technique is that we're never we're not making the horse afraid of the aids. We're getting it to accept the aids and, and accept that this is a coordination between the horse and the rider. <coughs> a really good canter here. This is immensely improved. Look how beautifully soft the underside of the neck stays throughout this canter and how round and what a slower and deeper canter this is. This just looks immensely better than the last time I saw you. So yes, I think you're certainly getting to the point where this horse could certainly go uh, to a show pretty soon at training level and you could do really well. Now, once again, just you have to be sure that all you can do all of this without the shambone on. But I think, uh, in fact, you don't have the shambone on here. So <coughs> I think you're well on your way. This is a beautiful stretch. You know, you have a really nice position. I see nothing wrong there. Your legs are quite quiet. Your hands are quite quiet. You know, really, really good. You should be able to continue with this horse and work right up through the levels. Once again, understanding that when we work horses correctly, they don't resist everything. That's why people have such a hard time riding some of these horses. You know, when you see trainers that have whipped horses up into a false frame, the students can never ride like that, you know, and then it becomes this big drama. Of course, the horses aren't over their back, so then they try to do upper level movements, and it's all a big struggle because the horse isn't prepared for it. But this is absolutely beautiful, and the, the difference in this horse and last time is simply night and day. I, once again, I suggest that you yourselves go back. The horse's muscling is looking longer and sleeker. That's exactly what we want. The horse looked a little bunched up last time I saw it. And once again, you can see that hole there behind the saddle and the silhouette. But once again, you're going to see that improve immensely. And it certainly has improved a little bit since I saw you last. But once again, it's going to take, and we must think in terms of years, not in terms of months, when it, terms to, uh, it comes to developing this top line on the horse. It takes two years to put a foundation on a horse. You know, and when you are doing it right and you're not being interrupted by constant lameness, once again, that's why it's so important to work your horses correctly so that you're not constantly losing muscle to downtime, which I see so many people doing. I'm spending so much time with veterinarians and getting injections and this sort of thing, you know, um, we have a barn full of horses and none of them get any kind of injections. They're not on any kind of injections whatsoever. You know, I trained horses for many, many years, you know, and was a three-day event rider and, and uh, trained fox hunting horses for years and, you know, horses that had to be sound and go sound for miles and miles and miles a day. And, you know, we were able to do that without the help of injections and these kind of things. So once again, it's not to say that these don't have a place. I mean, certainly there may be some some horses, you know, due to arthritic conditions or or whatever, or damage that's been done to them. But, you know, if you're having to inject your six-year-olds, you know, there's something seriously wrong with what you're doing and seriously wrong with any veterinarian who doesn't tell you, you know, the real answer to your question. Um, and that's why, you know, I firmly believe and I personally work with veterinarians who ride horses. I won't work with veterinarians who aren't riders um, because they just don't have the same kind of uh, feel for the horses. You know, I was very fortunate in my youth to, to grow up when I worked in Unionville, Pennsylvania. Our next door neighbor was Matthew McKay Smith, who started Equus Magazine. You know, in Kentucky, John O'Brien, who was the greatest vet in Kentucky, was my vet from the time I was, you know, a child. Um, and these men, you know, were, were really like those kind of great old guys, you know, uh, uh, from uh, from those English books, you know, all creatures great and small or something, who really cared about the animals, not just making their next house payment. So um, those are the kind of people that I look to work for and the same kind of trainers you should want to look for who really care about the animals and, you know, above monetary gain. Unfortunately, you know, it's uh, people can make a lot of quick cash in the horse business these days, you know, by selling horses off. Um, that are not correctly trained, forcing them into frames, you know, fooling people, you know, a lot of big names fool a lot of people because they're so enamored of the big name that they don't realize the person's taking them to the cleaners. And I've seen horses come from some of the top barns in Europe, you know, that came out of those barns drugged when they were bought and things like that. So, you know, just you just have to watch out for that all the time, the mentality of these kind of people.
But beautiful in this stretch here once again. You've just done a great job with this horse since I saw you last. This is so on track from what I saw the last time. Immensely improved. You know, when you get into that place right there, yeah, just ask for a little more, which you do. So every time I think in my mind, I'm about to think, well, if I were there, I'd tell you this. You're already doing it. So you've already gained a lot of uh, good horsemanship about, you know, feeling when the horse is right and when it's wrong. And I can see that from the work that you've done, much improved, even if you guys aren't aware of it yourselves. But hopefully after seeing this video, you'll go back and compare a little bit with what you saw the last time and, and you know, have the courage to, to go on with what you're doing. I know it's very difficult. You know, to ride horses correctly because, you know, we live in a world where it's, it's, um, everything has been really dumbed down and the people who get, you know, everybody wants to be right, you know, and, uh, especially in the horse business. I'm, I've never seen anything in my life where, you know, it's, I see people with musical instruments all the time. The first time they buy musical instruments, they aren't instant, instant experts in music. Well, that doesn't seem to be true with horses. It seems to be as soon as somebody buys one, they seem to think they know everything about it, um, especially if they've had it for a year or so. Um, so this is what we must guard against all the time, having the faith to keep doing what you're doing and knowing that in time, you know, you will move ahead of everybody around you if you continue to do what you're doing. As opposed to, you know, I know that a lot of people write to me, oh, everybody around me is telling me all I'm doing is running around, horse around on the forehand. Well, you know so are they they just don't realize it <laughs> that being the point only only those horses that are hollow are never going to come off the forehand they're going to always be on the forehand no matter how high they get them lifting their legs up that's the thing you have to remember you know you can't pull a horse into collection you can develop a horse into collection and that's the only way you can achieve real collection and remember what real collection is is once the horse is round over its back it simply lowers the three joints of the hind legs and maintains that lowering, and that's what real collection is. It's not shortening the horse's frame and making it snap its legs up. Really nice leg heel here. Just all this is absolutely excellent. I'm just loving this. Once again, you can see how that horse uh, paddles a little bit on that left foreleg, but it doesn't seem to bother him at all. And once again, what you will find, you know, as the horse gets stronger, even though that is a conformational issue, you'll have much less troubles with that issue. And the horse will, it will tend to straighten it out a little bit. So once again, I mean, that's not, that's a conformational thing, but once again, and why it's so important with a horse, that, especially a horse that has a little conformational fault, you know, it's so even more important that we get them over the backs because if we don't, that conformational fault could lead to an injury down the line. So very important that we do everything in the right order. But what a beautiful ride this has been. I've been really impressed with how far you, you folks have come. I just love to see this when people send me these things. And once again, proving that once again, if you can walk, trot, and canter as reasonably well as you can here as you're riding in this video, you can train a horse to any level once you understand that all you have to do is simply let the horse develop into those levels, that there's nothing you can do in terms of pulling, forcing, um, all the kinds of things that we see people doing that are going to make any difference. But this will, and the horse will come up um, if you watch Amber's lessons. Um, That's why I'm happy to get those horse, uh, those videos up, so people can see what comes next. But it, once again, it's not like we're just going to put the horse, you know, on on its uh, nose and then just keep it there forever. We're going to every day, as soon as we can get the horse all the way down, as you're doing here, we're going to start trying to bring it back up. Which you did a lovely job right there. You were able to do that little shoulder in. There wasn't any major change in the rhythm. So I hope that uh, the people around you folks are beginning to take notice. I see you're in the barn there, but I don't know if you guys are the trainers or just boarders or what you are, but but uh, you're doing a great job with it. And that's what I hope for everyone around the world, you know, when we get all these people that are doing this, you know, seeing their friends' uh, horses develop and change, you know, once again, just have the strength and purpose of purpose, so to speak, to keep doing what you're doing and knowing that once you're getting this, you're well on your way. This horse is going to improve beautifully. Pretty nice little shoulder four coming down there. Really good. And right back into the stretch again. I love how you do that. Exactly what we want to do. Once again, remembering that the muscle is built in that stretch. It's not built when you come up. You know, we we had a very high level trainer here, so to speak, you know, get in front of this group of people and tell them that, oh, your horse will never develop unless you, you know, draw its neck back into its body and hold it there. Well, that's complete nonsense. That's all that will do is develop a horse in, in a in a wrong way. And yes, you may be able to get impressive movements from uh, 
that are impressive to people who don't know what they're looking at because once again if the horse isn't lowering behind once you understand what collection is and you go and watch some of these upper level tests and you'll see wait a minute this horse isn't collected there's no lowering whatsoever and unfortunately the judges we've let we've let our standards slide so much in dressage you know that that now the scores are you know for someone just doing a decent test it's getting up into the ridiculous you know 90s and things like this because you know, if everybody doing it wrong is getting a 75, what are you going to do for the people that are doing it right, you know? And unfortunately that, you know, the scores used to guide, it used to be that you knew that if you didn't break a 50%, you know, that you weren't sufficient at that level. And once again, remember, if a horse is not working over its back, nothing it's doing should be able to score higher than a five because it's insufficient, which is, you know, the concept of dressage judging five, meaning the level at which the horse is sufficient, it's schooling sufficiently at that level, and then the score above five is, you know, how brilliantly you're doing it, so to speak, and how how well and other little inaccuracies that can happen. But, you know, we need to get back to that in, in scoring, and, you know, 90% of the horses uh, that we see schooling today would have to go back to training level, or even that, because they're not working over their backs. But that's what we need to do, because we basically need a re-education, a re-up of everything, um, and get away from this... Um, idea that everybody needs to be rewarded at a horse show. It's again coming back to the walk here. You can be stretching a little deeper here. You just you've just sort of lost your contact there and just letting the horse kind of walk along. That's okay for a minute, but I'd like to see if just when when you're on them, I want to see keep that stretch all the time. Like you do now. So you took back your contact and you got the horse backed. And that's the position we always want to work up through the gears and work back down through the gears with a young horse. When, of course, when I say young horse, I mean a horse that's not developed, whether it's uh, 17 years old or 2 years old. I think of them all as young horses because they're simply undeveloped. So really great work here. Um, I hope I've answered your questions, but you really have answered them yourselves. You've done a wonderful job with this horse and uh, since I saw you last. And just know that if you continue the work that you're on, everything is just going to come together absolutely beautifully for you. absolutely night and day between the last video that I saw of this horse. And you'd really do a great job riding it. This is exactly what we want to do at the end is just let the horse stretch out and finish where we began in the walk and the stretch. Remember, that's my rule of thumb. If you can't get on a horse and stretch it in the walk, then you need to be doing groundwork with the horse until you can. And once we understand this, we just don't send ourselves back. I see trainers all the time, even some who try to understand the stretch, but they work the horse for an hour and then they try to stretch. <laughs> the stretch should be the foundation of, you, of what you do, not just the thing you do at the very end of the session or that you try to do maybe once or twice badly. You know, we see it at the horse shows all the time. You know, they put the stretches in the test, and I was so excited when they did back 20 years ago, thinking, oh, well, finally, you know, we're going to have something in the test that's going to prove the value. And now judges love it when they see a good stretch because they rarely do. And I'm amazed at how I see so many trainers who just even ignore it. They get to the horse show and just tell their, oh, just kind of let go of the reins a little bit. You know, and the horses kind of poke their nose out. They don't really stretch into the contact. But when you see a horse that does that, the show, everything else, you know, should have been under a five. Once again, if the horse is not working over its back in any gate, at any level, the score should not be higher than a five. Is it because it's insufficient? That is, the horse is not sufficiently developed for the level it's trying to be shown at. And once again, that's what's led to the downfall of dressage, the ever higher scores. Um, the fact that, you know, we have so many judges now making a profession of judges, and they all know that the mentality of the riders is, you know, they, they all know who hand out the big scores, and that's who the you know, the corporate giants who put on the horse shows now, they want to hire all those judges so everybody's happy and they don't get any complaints and everybody goes home with a 65% at least, you know. But once again, that has been the downfall of the sport. And, and sadly, not the sport itself, but just so many <laughs> beautiful horses. And that's the really sad thing. Once again, it's the horses who pay the price um, for bad training and uh, and these kinds of things and, and the fact that shows have begun, you know, to be... Uh, scored in such a way that it, it doesn't help the horses. The horses just end up going home and suffering. Every time somebody who's you know bad at training level gets a 70% and goes home and think they're ready to move to the next level, it's the horse that pays the price. So once again, we should all be um, over time writing to the AHSA or whatever they call themselves these days, the USET, and uh, you know demanding that we ultimately get to a point as black 
Klaus Bockenhall, when he was briefly our coach, suggested that no one should know who the judges are at a horse show. The judges should be pulled from a lottery. When you want to put on a horse show, you call up, they pull a couple of names from the lottery, and people, and it's not announced until the day of the horse show. Nowadays, they announce who the judges are because everyone knows who the judges are who hand out the big scores. So they look for those judges to go to those horse shows. Well, you know, once again, that that mentality has been the downfall of the sport. Great job. This is Will Faber from Art to Ride. I look forward to seeing your next one. Stay right on track because you are doing a wonderful job with this horse. Great job.